Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ridge Chapel. It's so good to have you worshiping with us this morning. Hope you're blessed by the fellowship time that we have together as well. Uh, I think that's all the announcements except for this noon. I think there's a meeting for vacation Bible school planning. So stay here for lunch. I think that's going to be provided as well, and uh, they'll get that kind of stuff taken care of. Unless there's any other announcements we need to make, let's go ahead for our call to worship. Would you stand with me, please? Let's read this together from Psalm 34, 2 and 3. My soul will glorify the Lord. The humble will hear about it and rejoice. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us lift up his name together. How majestic is your name. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, we praise your name. Oh, Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God, oh, Lord, God almighty. Oh, Lord, our Lord. As we prepare for communion this morning, make sure that you have your emblems ready so that you might participate uh, after the meditation time. You can go ahead and sit down. <laughs> It'll be a little while. Uh, we're going to sing it first, aren't we? <laughs> I messed up. Come on. <laughs> Sorry, it's been one of those mornings. You can sit down, though. You can sit down. That's fine. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. The consecrated cross I'll bear till death. It's because I had communion this morning that I got all confused, I guess. <laughs> Next Sunday is Memorial Day weekend. Every year we set aside a day to remember those who have gone before us. But what does it really mean to remember? In our Western heritage, I think remembering means recollecting or recalling to mind something or someone that is no longer a present reality. On Memorial Day, we remember those who are no longer with us. But in the Jewish heritage, remembering is an active way of bringing past realities into our present day living. It means participating here and now in the certain defining events in the past as well as in the future. One of the Old Testament examples is the rainbow. 
after the flood, God tells Noah that he will never cover the whole earth in judgment with water again. When we see a rainbow in the clouds, we remember that God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. The covenantal sign of the rainbow reassures us of God's promises that still apply today and always will. The Passover is another Old Testament example of this kind of remembrance. And speaking of the Passover in Exodus 12, 14, the Lord told Moses, this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. It's during the time of this Passover feast that Jesus establishes what we call the Lord's Supper. And every week here at Ridge Chapel, we remember that Jesus died on the cross, and we're reassured that the reality of his redemption still applies to us today and to everyone else. Today, before we take the bread and the fruit of the vine, let's take time to reflect on what we are to remember with this short video clip. Let's take the bread together. And the cup. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for reminding us of all that this means to us and all that it means to you. The restoration of our relationship with our God and Father. Thank you for the blood of Christ, for his body on the cross, for his resurrection, and for the life that it gives us eternally. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, as we sing this song, the young people may be dismissed to their classes, if I'm not in the wrong order again. <laughs> holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, holy, holy.
Now, have you ever experienced an embarrassing memory loss? Well, I know you have, because I certainly have. A number of times, people have approached me and asked, do you remember me? I look at their faces, and I know that I've met them. But I just don't remember their name. Now, the sad thing is that it's happening more and more often now as I'm getting older. There have been times, though, when I was preaching along and forgot what I was going to say next. At times like that, you sometimes grope for words until your memory returns and you remember what you meant to say. Now, the story is told. And I don't know whether this is a true story or not, but it's a good preacher's story, so I'll tell it to you. The story is told about a young preacher who went to hear an old and well-known preacher, thinking that maybe he could pick up a few preaching hints. As he listened, in his sermon, the old preacher made this amazing statement. Some of the most meaningful moments of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. Well, you can imagine, instantly, the old preacher had the attention of everybody in the congregation. Everybody was now listening very intently to what he was saying. And the young preacher thought, boy, that is really an attention getter. The old preacher repeated it to make sure everybody got it. He said, some of the most meaningful moments of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. And then he went on to explain that the woman he was talking about was his father's wife. In other words, his mother. Okay. Well, the young preacher thought, that was great. I'm going to use that in my sermon next week. So the next week he was preaching along and he made the same statement. Some of the most memorable moments in my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. And it worked for him too. I mean, everybody perked up. And this young preacher, not used to having every eye on him, paying so much attention, that he decided to say the same thing again, only more, with a little bit more flair. So gesturing and speaking, he said those same words. Some of the most memorable moments of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. And then he forgot the punchline. <laughs> he stumbled around in his words for a few moments and then said, for the life of me, I can't remember whose wife it was. <laughs> Now, I've never had quite that bad an experience. <laughs> but in Philippians, the third chapter in the 17th verse, I mean the 7th through the 11th verse, the Apostle Paul wrote, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness 
of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Now listen to these last two verses. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now as I read those verses, I know Paul's in prison in Rome, as I'm reading those, I can just picture him pausing in the midst of his writing. He leans back in his chair and begins to remember why he became a Christian and what has happened since that day. Once he was looked upon as a man of great influence among the Jews, a member of the ruling aristocracy with great wealth and fame available to him. Soldiers and servants followed him wherever he went. But Paul had given all of that up to follow a man known as a carpenter a man who didn't own anything except the clothes he wore. And when asked why, Paul says, I looked at all I once had and decided it was rubbish. Paul has come to realize that if you have all the things of the world, but you don't know Christ. You're poor indeed. But if you have Christ, you're rich indeed. Paul was convinced that Jesus is the pearl of great price, the hidden treasure in the field. He's worth selling everything Paul had in order to have him. And that is the message, I think, we need to hear today. So we're going to look at that last two sentences. Paul said, you want to know why I became a Christian? You, know, you want to know why I follow Christ? It's because I looked at all the things that the world desires and I count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. And verse 10, he goes on to say, I want to know Christ. And the only thing he says is that really counts is Christ. Now, two people get married. They love each other as they've never loved anyone else. And then they began to understand more about God's love for us. Now, even more, I believe, you have a baby. And as you hold that baby, I've heard parents say, I think I understand the love of God better now than ever before. I mean, we go through many experiences in life. Victories, defeats, troubles, trials problems and heartaches, but every time we turn a corner, there's Christ, and we get to know him better as we rub shoulders with him and experience his power in us. Now, notice what Paul says in verse 10 and 11. First of all, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Paul begins with the resurrection. And he begins with it. He doesn't end with it. He begins there because that is when he first met Jesus. Once 
Once long ago, he had learned facts about this Jesus. He had studied hard to get all the facts together. He concluded that Jesus was an imposter and that the greatest service he could render to God was to destroy the church. So he sets out to persecute the Christians, thinking that he was doing God, he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. Then one day on his way to Damascus, he met the resurrected Christ. You see, we've all been in the same fix that Paul was in. We were lost, headed for a Christless grave with no hope for eternity. But through the power of his resurrection, God lifted us up and has given us new life inside and out. And we want that power. We power to, as the world doesn't even begin to understand, power to overcome our problems and our difficulties. And I want that, don't you? But Paul doesn't stop there. He went on to say, I also want the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Now, wait a minute, Paul. Sharing his resurrection is okay. But sharing in his sufferings? Isn't that going a bit too far? You know, a veteran of World War II proudly proclaimed that he was a member of the Survivors Club of the attack on Pearl Harbor. There were not many of them left but he was one of them. And as he spoke, you could tell that he and his brothers had suffered together. And because they had suffered together, a unique fellowship existed among them. Now, alcoholics go through the same thing. Those who have overcome their alcoholism can understand it better than others because they have suffered the same pain, the same hurts. People who experience divorce can help other people who are going through divorce because they have felt the same thing, same hurts. They know what it's like. People who have lost children can help others who are coming through that same experience because they've been there. They hurt the same hurts. So there is a fellowship of suffering. Look at Paul's life. He was beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, thrown into prison time and time again. And when he looked at the scars on his body, scars inflicted by whips and the stones, the lashings, he called them the marks of Christ. I bear on my body the marks of Christ, he said. Do you want to suffer with Jesus? I think that can happen in a lot of different ways. A minister went to his barber during a time when scandalous news had come out about some prominent preachers. The barber, who had been cutting his hair for 15 years, said, Preacher, are you laying low this week? And the preacher said, Why? Well, he said, all preachers are suspect now, aren't they? And you probably have a group of people looking over your shoulder, just waiting for you to make a mistake. 
wondering if you're a phony too. It's sad, isn't it? If one Christian stumbles and falls, often all of us are seen as phonies. Jesus suffered when they brought sinners to him. He looked at the city of Jerusalem, remember, on that last week, and he cried. He cried because Jerusalem had been offered forgiveness, and they turned their backs on it. Sin causes hearts to be broken. We suffer with Jesus when we look at the world caught up in sin and selfishness. We weep over it in to share in the sufferings of Jesus. Then Paul says, I want to know Christ by becoming like him in his death. Now, I don't want to die, at least not yet. I want to live. And I guess all of us do. But in a sense, every moment that we live for Jesus, we're also dying for him. Some of us are moving toward that moment when we will finally lay down our body and take up our new existence with Jesus. Paul literally died for him by being beheaded because of Christ. Now, history records that all but one of the apostles were killed for proclaiming Jesus. Only John is said to have lived to old age, and he was severely persecuted, exiled to the tiny island of Patmos. There's something precious about being able to say, I've lived out my time on earth for Christ. I've given him my time, my energy, my talent. And I'm willing to become like him even in my death. John Wilson preached for 44 years in Springfield, Ohio. At the age of 75, he was still preaching. He often introduced himself to others by saying, I'm John Wilson. You've never heard of me, but you have heard of my brother, Seth. Now, let me just pause for a second. Many of you here who live in the area of Ozark Christian College, and a lot more people besides that, know who Seth Wilson was, a tremendous teacher and leader. And he'd say, I'm, you don't know me, but I'm the brother of Seth. John spent most of his life preaching in a congregation in a little town of Springfield, Ohio. He built a strong church there and was wondering how to pass the baton on to a younger man who would follow him. He asked, when I quit preaching, I think about it, I'm 75 years old, ready to pass the responsibilities on to a younger preacher. He asked, when I quit preaching, do I have to quit ministering? Do I have to stop calling on people? Do I have to stop praying with them? You see, he didn't want to interfere with the new man who's coming, but his question was, do I have to stop serving? I don't want to stop serving my Lord. And when you looked into his eyes, you saw the marks of Jesus, marks of kindness, understanding, sympathy, 
that had been etched in his face over decades of serving, decades of faithful preaching, decades of marrying young people in love and burying the people who die, decades of counseling and praying and serving. He wore a watch made by Timex. His suit came from J.C. Penney. He drove a compact car. You didn't see his name in the headlines of the newspapers, but he left everything to follow Jesus. And that is the greatest epitaph, I believe, that anyone can wear. In a time of materialism, corruption, it seems to me that there's not a passage in the Bible that has more to say to the church than the one we've been considering this morning. In closing, Paul said, I want to know Christ. And then he ended this passage and so attain to the resurrection from the dead. You see, we don't offer an invitation that just promises a resurrection or the power of the resurrection. The invitation also includes the fellowship of suffering, the promise of death, and our resurrection from the dead to be with Jesus forever. Now, some may not want that kind of an invitation, but it's important for us to understand that the invitation always includes that, whether you want it or not. That's the only way we're ever going to get and gain Christ and get to know him. You'll find, as Paul found, that's well worth it. Christ is that pearl of great price. He's a hidden treasure. He is worth whatever sacrifice we may be called upon on this earth to give in order to gain and know him. Paul, sitting in prison, writing this letter to the church at Philippi, thinks about what he once was and what he is now, even as a prisoner. And he's saying, I haven't lost a thing. I've gained everything when I gained Christ. And I look forward to that day well, we're going to sing our hymn of invitation. If anyone is here that needs to make a decision, needs prayer, needs to accept Christ, needs to get more active than you've been, we invite you to come and make it public as we stand, as we sing. <coughs> hymns. Some have passages in them or sections or words in them that unless we know the Bible quite well, 
we don't exactly know what it means. But, oh, to know the love of Christ, to know the fellowship of Christians together, to be able to share our lives together means so much. And so we can sing with joy, gratefulness, and dedication. Please be seated. This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you his peace.